Hello, my name is Jennifer D. Simone, and I serve as the director for cutaneous lymphoma at the Anovashar Cancer Institute in Fairfax, Virginia, right outside of DC. I'm very happy for the opportunity today to participate with Checkware and to provide my thoughts on two subjects, which are basically subgroups of cutaneous T cell lymphomas. Um, I find very commonly that patients are referred to me in consultation with a concern for a rash that may or may not involve atypical lymphocytes um, and a question of possible cutaneous T cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides has been raised by the clinician. Sometimes that question was raised pre-biopsy based on clinical exam, but unfortunately, sometimes that question arose purely based on some of the commentary in the pathology report. And what I've encountered is that patients arrive for their consultation having spent many weeks um, worried about the possibility of having a skin lymphoma when in fact that's not truly the case. So what I want to just touch on is the very challenging scenario wherein you have a patient with a nondescript erythematous scaly eruption and a pathology report that mentions possible mycosis fungoides. So when you encounter a patient who has a rash that's not responding to therapy for presumed much more common diagnoses, such as atopic dermatitis, allergic contact, derm, et cetera, um, they've been treated with topical steroids, perhaps in some settings they've been treated with other um, lymphocytic infiltrate blockers, and they just have not shown a, a, an expected clinical response, then the clinician starts to expand their differential, and sometimes that differential then expands to include things like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, which then appropriately leads to a skin biopsy. And then you get a report back that says, you know, lymphocytic infiltrate cannot rule out mycosis fungoides. Um, however, that is not sufficient to even really raise that diagnosis with the patient, particularly in the setting of a, a plan to pass them on to a, a consultant with a CTCL um, subspecialty clinic. So when you're reviewing these pathology reports, it's really critical that at least three to four of the required diagnostic criteria are present. Number one, there should be a lymphocytic infiltrate involving the epidermis. That lymphocytic infiltrate should be atypical. You should be able to um, contact the pathologist and they should verify that the, the cells under the microscope, maybe if they don't show the pathognomonic cerebriform nuclear contours, they at least have a consistent degree of atypia in the infiltrate. And that's really necessary to even start to consider something in the T cell dyscrasia realm. Importantly, you want to see an absence of spongiosis. So many of these patients, they just have really aggravated atopic derm, and you can get a little bit of lymphocyte atypia in that setting, particularly with lots of trauma, you know, from scratching and rubbing habitually. But if you're not seeing that you've got epidermal atypical lymphocytes and there's plenty of spongiosis, it makes it very unlikely that the primary process is dyscrasia. Um, additionally, you want to um, look for, you know, ideally potromicroabscesses, which goes to a certain constellation of lymphocytes in the epidermis. And then when you look at the immunohistochemistry, which is not automatically ordered by a lot of um, commercial derm path outfits, you want to start to further define that lymphocytic infiltrate. You want to see that those atypical lymphocytes are CD4 positive or if the lesions clinically are hypopigmented, maybe CD8 positive. But you really need to have that dermatopathologist report to you, is there loss of CD7? There should be at least 50% reduction in CD7 if you're going to consider it a T cell dyscrasia or an early evolving mycosis fungoides. Um, and then furthermore, you know, for more advanced cases, you can start to also request um, specific comments on CD30 positivity, CD52 positivity, et cetera. But you've really got to see that some of these critical elements on the immunohistochemistry are present. And also, I should mention that you should ideally get the CD4 to 8 ratio reported. And that 4 is normal. Anything under 4 really shouldn't be worried about a T-cell dyscrasia. If you start to get near the 8 to 10 range on that CD4 to 8 ratio, that's when the pieces start to fit together that perhaps there is a T-cell dyscrasia in play. 
Now, when we use the term T cell dyscrasia, what does this mean? Well, I like to think about T cell um, issues in the skin as existing on a spectrum. On the more benign end of the spectrum, you have dysregulation physiologically of those T cells that correlates with a mild degree of atypia and some minor changes in the immunohistochemical profile. Um, then you kind of move over a little bit to an early evolving mycosis fungoides type picture. And in that scenario, you would expect to see that things are a little bit more evolved. Um, and then there are the well-defined cutaneous T cell lymphomas of both indolent and aggressive subtypes. But today, what I'm really talking about is that benign end trending toward that early mycosis fungoides um, picture. And so when you're counseling these patients on what's going on here, essentially what I like to tell them is you've got a dysregulation in your immune cells in your skin that is likely isolated to the skin, and it falls under a bunch of different names, which is what I was alluding to earlier. T-cell dyscrasia is one of these synonyms. Small plaque parasoriasis, sort of an old-fashioned term, but certainly one that is used um, routinely to this day. Pseudolymphomatous drug eruption, cutaneous lymphoid hyperplasia. All of these terms, unfortunately, are confusingly used interchangeably, um, but they all kind of describe the same thing, which is some degree of T cell dysregulation with inadequate clinical or histopathologic diagnostic criteria to label these patients as having mycosis fungoides. Now, what causes this T cell dyscrasia? We don't totally know. We do know that it's linked with several um, categories of medications. These are loose observed associations. These are not you know, hard and fast, clear cut cause and effect relationships. But I always ask patients about hydrochlorothiazide use and the chronology of the rash as it pertains to them being on that medication. Some patients can be on hydrochlorothiazide for a decade and then develop an issue take them off the hydrochlorothiazide, the rash goes away. So the only time that the chronology really can disprove that there may be a contributing element from the hydrochlorothiazide is if the rash predates the drug. Also, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors as a class are linked with T-cell dyscrasias in the skin as well as mycosis fungoides. Anticonvulsants are also in this category. And then lastly, you know, even, even more poorly defined are herbal supplements, dietary additives, things that are not regulated by the FDA, but that are used um, very commonly in the US. Those types of drugs can also contribute to some of these rashes that involve T cell dysregulation and a small amount of T cell dyscrasia. So when you encounter these patients, if you have the benefit of referring them to a CTCL multidisciplinary clinic, send them there. They're complicated, takes a lot of time to um, counsel these patients and educate them. They need to be followed over time, likely with serial biopsies, e either every six months or annually, and we're happy to manage those patients. If you're in a setting where you don't have access to that type of clinic or tertiary center, then the guidelines suggest that you first, you know, go through the drug list, try as best you can to remove any of these drugs that I've mentioned for at least a six month period to allow a washout. Um, in cases where the patient is very anxious and wants to know, is this just a T cell dyscrasia, a benign entity, or is this actually mycosis fungoides? There is um, additional molecular testing beyond T cell gene rearrangement PCR that can be done. It's called high throughput sequencing. And there's a company called ClonoSeq that can assist with that. And with very high specificity, they can determine whether this is benign or malignant. And so I find this especially useful in the instance of a young, healthy patient who has tremendous anxiety and really wants to know in a binary fashion, do I have a problem or do I have a benign issue? And so it, about six times a year, I'll use high throughput sequencing in that type of environment. Um, in terms of counseling them, it is important to counsel patients that mycosis fungoides can take on average seven plus years to fully declare itself diagnostically. And so you counsel those patients that they will be followed clinically and that serial biopsies may be appropriate to look for further maturity and further sort of diagnostic declaration histopathologically of an impending mycosis fungoides. What really motivates me in terms of 
further analyzing these patients is the acceleration or the pace of their rash. So I, I ask patients, you know, how long have you had this? And many will say, oh, I've had this for 10 years, 20 years, but I finally went to a dermatologist, got a biopsy, and now I find out I've got mycosis fungoides. In that situation, after doing a thorough head-to-toe exam, um, asking them about any systemic issues or other illnesses, and then doing a thorough um, skin draining lymph node basin exam around the head and neck, axilla and groin, if all of that is normal, the workup really can stop right there. And clinical follow-up and management of disease is the focus for the practitioner. If, however, the patient comes in and says, yeah, this all started you know, six months ago and every two weeks I'm getting another patch. That to me would suggest a much more aggressive pace. These may be patients that are not on track as the majority of patients are to remain in early stage, stage 1A disease. These are patients who may be evolving into higher stages of illness and therefore I need to do a more complete workup on those patients. Again, of course, thorough history, clinical exam, including a nodal exam. And then um, in that setting, I would get a baseline peripheral blood flow cytometry with the cutaneous T cell lymphoma panel. Unfortunately, this is not commercially available. Um, typically, it needs to be done at a center where someone like me has worked with the pathologist to set up the flow cytometry such that it matches with the current staging system so that you can assess their blood stage. But that is you know, a baseline lab that I do um, routinely run in that scenario coupled with TCR gene rearrangement in the blood and a CBC. And so there I've got a baseline in those patients. Um, if I do not palpate any abnormal nodes on exam, there's no role for imaging. Some, some providers will say, you know what, I get a PET CT on everybody and they have their justification for that. But um, in large circles where we've discussed this as um, CTCL practitioners, the, the common theme is if there's no palpable adenopathy in a stage 1A patient, there's really minimal to no role for even baseline imaging, let alone um, subsequent surveillance imaging. Now, if on exam, the patient's got any degree of lymphadenopathy, that may be dermatopathic, meaning they're just reactive nodes to the inflammation in the skin. Again, we're assessing the skin draining nodal basins. Or it may be that they've got a very rare picture where they have minimal skin disease, but they've got some nodal disease. And in that situation, a PET CT is optimal um, because the CT chest, abdomen, pelvis is going to show you that the nodes are enlarged. You know that from exam, but it does not help you differentiate a benign reactive dermatopathic node from a malignant tumor-filled node, whereas the PET CT will also give you information about how metabolically active that nodal tissue is, and that tracks with um, higher concern for malignancy. So in a patient with minimal disease on the skin, it's unlikely that you're going to find um, significant nodal changes, but if you do, PET CT is preferred over chest, abdomen, pelvis CT, um, depending on what their insurance will cover. But one thing that really is almost never indicated in the workup of a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma patient, certainly not an early stage patient, is bone marrow biopsy. Um, the, the only scenario where we would be doing bone marrow biopsy is if we've got a very sick, advanced stage patient who's maybe already been exposed to some cytotoxic chemotherapies or we're considering stem cell transplant and we need to know, you know what their overall synthetic function is in their marrow. In that situation, that would be sort of a separate heme-onc concern that's treatment-based, and it is not part of the basic workup. Bone marrow biopsy results are not included in the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma staging system. Therefore, it's generally not indicated. And I just wanted to add that today because, unfortunately, given the rarity of this disease, oftentimes patients will see a dermatologist, they'll get a biopsy, it shows mycosis fungoides, or even unfortunately, question of mycosis fungoides, and then that dermatologist sends them to a hemonc or a medonc specialist in the community who then applies the systemic lymphoma workup algorithm to those patients, um, subjecting them to nuclear medicine studies, bone marrow biopsies, et cetera, that truly are not indicated for those patients. So I think it's really important to, A, 
counsel patients who do not fulfill criteria for MF that they may have a benign dysregulation of their cutaneous T cells that is unlikely to evolve into anything else, but that requires long-term monitoring to ensure that it is not trending toward mycosis fungoides. And then secondarily to counsel mycosis fungoides patients that they do not necessarily require a full court press systemic lymphoma workup. And that really is reserved for patients who have a large tumor burden on their skin and or the rare patient who may have limited skin disease but has obvious nodal disease on exam. So I hope that this has been helpful and thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this great program.